Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is part of the great stuff. This is the AAAS Journal Author Series. And I am very happy to have Chen Yu Chuang and Christian Jesperson with us today. Hello, Chen Yu and Christian. Hello, Hi, good Frank. Frank. Cool. Uh, Franklin, Chen Yu, let's start with you. What's your, what's your geolocation? Yeah, I'm now in Taipei, Taiwan, and it's a great season now. Yeah. Oh, lovely. The, yeah, it's spring now, and the air is cozy and not too hot, so Beautiful. great. Beautiful. I wish I could say the same. It is May 17th, 2024, as we record this. I'm in Phoenix. We're in the desert. It's starting to get hot. <laughs> so our lovely time is before and after, but we're a little warm right now. And Christian, how about you? Where are you located at? I'm in uh, in Princeton in uh, in New Jersey, so I can also taunt you with fantastic weather uh, oh, and my vegetable, vegetable garden doing very well. Garden State living up to its name. Uh, um, so uh, so I'm I'm really enjoying that. Uh, very nice, <laughs> very cool, very cool. And Christian, let's start with you. What do you what do you like to do for research? So um, I think I I really love doing kind of new methods in astrophysics. I come from more of a, a background of being fascinated by uh, how we know that we know the things that we think that we know, yeah. um, which is uh, statistics uh, and, and new methods for, for discovering new things uh, in astrophysics. So I'm not particularly picky about uh, exactly where to apply that, although I do have a, a galaxies do have a special place in my heart. Um, um, but it is the, 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 the core tenant on this is, uh, uh, new methods, new things. And so, uh, just widely applied. Um, so yeah, I, I worked on a little bit of everything. Uh, um, yeah. And I love the blackboard over you there. You got all kinds of lovely, you. Yeah, yeah, lovely scribbles going over there. Hopefully yes. some new things. So very cool. Very cool. And Franklin, Chen Yu, what do you like to do for research? Yeah. So based on my bioinformatic background and astrophysics background I like to pretty much combine the like the algorithm part from bioinformatics with the physics part in the astronomy and do more astrophysics research uh, cool. specifically to like dark matter and galaxies research mm -hmm. yeah very cool very cool and that is going to bring us to this very awesome APJ article it is open access. It's the open access era, people. You can go grab a copy for free. Go get one. Leaving no branches behind. Predicting baryonic properties of galaxies from merger trees and Chen Yu and Christian. Take us away. Yeah, so this um, this paper was, was again, it falls into this uh, general ethos of, of trying to come up with new ways of, of, of learning about astrophysics. Um, um, one of the things that um, that that I remember we we saw when, when kind of coming into astrophysics, uh, coming in from from you know our reflective backgrounds, is that um, that that everybody kind of knows that galaxy formation takes place um, on merger trees. Like you you have um, when galaxies merge, that that fundamentally shapes how you know how they they they, they function. So it fundamentally shapes their properties, which okay. is one of the things that, you know, we are of course very interested in modeling. We always want to be able to model, you know, what is the property of a given galaxy at a given time and why is it that way? And everybody knows that a kind of a fundamental part of galaxy formation theory is that uh, that the merger tree is kind of the, is the backbone of, of, of those theories. Um, merger trees just being, you know, uh, if you scroll down a little bit uh, to figure one, um, just, you know, if I take a simulation and I, you know, I started, you know, at, you know whatever, whatever time, and then I, I run my simulation forward, um, I take a you know a snapshot at some time. I identify all the you know all the halos with all the galaxies inside, and uh -huh. then I take and I flip forward a little bit again, and I just see what has merged. And then you make this tree structure um, with okay. where the, uh, the edges that connect things just indicate whether or not something has merged. I'm with you. Yeah. And so these these merger trees here, I I love looking at them. I think they're fantastic. Um, but one of the one of the really really uh, sad things to me when when we when we started this is that people usually take these trees and then boil them down to summary statistics, like how many you know total points are in a tree, you know, like what was the yeah. like how long ago did the last major merger, so a, a merger where two things had similar mass, like had a, had a mass ratio of so that uh, of a high mass ratio, so they had similar masses. Yes. So they they boil them down to summary statistics and then they try to say based on those summary statistics we will try to learn something about the galaxy. 
Okay. Uh, at redshift zero or you know whenever. Whenever redshift. Uh, okay. And they all end up concluding that actually those features don't matter that much. Yeah. Um, so, you know, exactly like the, the times of the last major merger, they, you know, statistically speaking, don't matter a lot. Um, and we had a notion that maybe that is because you are doing this, you, uh, this condensation of information where you're, you're making summary statistics. Okay. Um, yes. So, yeah. um, the idea behind this was what if we can just take the merger tree and leave it unaltered? So we don't, we don't want to, um, we don't want to, to, to do any summary statistics. We don't want to boil it down to anything. We just want to, you know, take it in as is. Yes. As um, is. Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah, and just say, you know, the murder tree is a great structure. We just want to leave it as is uh, and then uh, uh, do some learning with that. Um, and I'll use that, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and you can do that um, through, um, you can do that by viewing the murder tree as a graph and then use a graph neural network. Yes. Um, okay. So as Christian said, that graph neural network takes exactly the graph into a neural network and output a tree or a graph. So that's exactly what we want. And now we can dive to the data preparation. So okay. actually, actually in data preparation, we got to have several limitations to select an augmentation of our measure tree. So for example, the most important thing is to avoid the data leakage from where well, we are doing machine learning. So we have training set and we got yeah. validation set and testing set. Yes. And therefore we want to avoid the information leakage from these different set. Ah, ah, okay. I'm with yeah, you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we want to remove is the face space information so that the, for the first thing is that we want to make sure any, everything is infrared. We don't want the result to be different if we shift the merger tree from like x equals to one to x equals to 10 or simply yeah. rotating it. Yeah. Right. And also we don't want the test set to know something about the training set. And if we input some face space information inside and the two merger trees aside are affecting each other, then there might be some information leakage. Okay. Okay. So we also prevent this kind of leakage in the data splitting. So we actually don't randomly sample the training set in and validation set in all the four simulation box. We sample the training set in one. So we cut the simulation box in eight equal size boxes and we sample only the training set for the training sub boxes and the validation sub boxes for validation set. Yeah, that's yep. basically how we do to our data. Cool. Then, okay, so for this section 2.3, we got graph neural networks. So actually a graph consists of two components. It's the first component is the node and it is kind of a box containing a key or features. So for example, if we're taking a sub halo in the measure tree, we maybe get its dark matter halo mass or dark matter halo size mm -hmm. and Vmax, etc. Then also we have another component called edge. The edge denotes the relation between the nodes. For example, we might have a merger relation between the two halos. Right. And also we can have an inherit relation if we got one sub halo inheriting most of the particles mm -hmm. inside oh. the previous snapshot. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then in the graph neural network, we need some operation to convert our dark matter halo properties into the galactic properties. Yes. So we define some operation called embedding. It's also consisting of two steps. The so one is the aggregation. So once so in the merger tree, one subhalo can aggregate the information from its parent subhalo in the previous snapshot. Okay. And also we can, and the next step we do is to update the uh, information. 
So from the so the updated information should come from its the dark matter properties from the subhalo itself and the aggregated messages from its parents. Okay. Yeah. So nice. it's basically the figure what the figure eight does. So um, we can figure eight. Oh, sorry, figure two. Eight. Sorry. Yeah, figure two. two uh, figure two A. Oh, yes. oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. My bad. Okay. Yeah, this is great. Okay. Yeah. Good. So this plot shows a very sophisticated, uh, a very sophisticated structure in our model. So first, Indeed. we have the edge model, and it takes into the edge attribute. As I stated, it's the relation between different subhalos. Yeah. And then we can output an updated message. Yes. <clears throat> and then we can put it into the node model in the next step. Mm -hmm. And then from the node model, we'll take into the updated messages and also the node features itself and to update a and to update the feature of the that specific node. And then the last step is to aggregate all the information from the edge and the nodes to combine it into a global a global feature. And then we can input the global features and the node features into the global model, and we can update the global feature. Cool. That's it. Yes. Okay. So after several iteration of training, so here in this plot, all the phi uh, all the function that is defined by phi mm -hmm. are learnable. So after several iteration of this training process, those phi will take into the dark matter properties and then output the galactic baryonic properties. Nice. Okay. Yes. Okay. Nice. So then we can also go to our rearrangement of the merger tree. So yes. why we rearrange our merger tree is because that, for example, in illustrious TNG, we got 100 snapshot and it's very inefficient if we want to like simply, if we want to the information from the first snapshot to the last snapshot to flow, right. we right. need a 100 layer graph neural network and it's very inefficient. And yeah. it also caused a problem called over smoothing, which will yeah. make the graph neural network simply predict the same value in the four merger trees right. if we got too many layers. So that's what we want to avoid. So then we, what we want to try is to uh, rearrange the merger tree so that the information can flow from the first snapshot to the last snapshot faster. Yes. And so here's what we do. We first classify our subhalos or nodes in the merger trees into five categories. Mm -hmm. So the first four categories are those related to the merger trees, which we want to preserve as much as we can their relation. Right. And then the fifth one, all the other subhalos are the isolated ones. Other ones. Okay. And okay. so here we can go to the figure 2B and we mm -hmm. can see the original merger tree is mm -hmm. denoted by the red arrows. Gotcha. And here we can see from the subhalo G to subhalo D, it is very, it's not quite related to merger events. It, there's no merger events but there. Right. So what we want to do is to make it, uh, make a shortcut between subhalo G and D so that the merger information can flow more efficiently. Yes. And also we can preserve the merger history for F and E by uh, making the information flowing from subhalo G directly to F and Correct. E. Yes. Yes. I'm so sorry. that's what we do here. Cool. This okay. implicitly also makes makes an assumption that the important thing in the merger tree is the mergers. So you know you're you're saying that like actually the information you should really care about is coming from the mergers, not necessarily from the thing right before you, but you should really focus on, on having this connection to the mergers. That yes. That's the important part. Okay. 
Very good. I'm with him. Yes. Cool. Okay. So, and then after defining the model, now we can go to the loss function we used for the model. So, well, actually the loss function consists of three different components, which in the first one, the loss, mm -hmm. it's a cross entropy loss, which can classify the, uh, that whether a subhalo contains star or have star formation activities, etc. Because yes. in TNG simulations, we can yeah. see that maybe 70% of dark matter halos don't contain stars and 80% of those halos lack of star formation activities and 40% of those don't have gas. So to predict the properties related to these things, we need to first remove those dark matter subhalos that do not have Anything. those kind of properties. For yeah. example, if if we have star inside the dark matter subhalo, we can predict the stellar metallicity, stellar mass, or the color. Cool. And then if we have star formation activity, we can predict the star formation rate. And if we have gas, then we go to predict the gas mass and gas metallicity. Yes, very okay. nice. Very nice. Yes. So for the regression loss, it's the main part of our model to predict the different properties. Yes. And we use a Gaussian loss or a Gaussian negative log likelihood loss, which can predict the property itself. And also we assume that the probability distribution is a Gaussian and we predict the, uh, the sigma of this Gaussian distribution. Yes. Mm -hmm. And lastly, to prevent overfitting for our model, we also tested uh, the L1 and L2 norms of all parameters in the GNN okay. so that, yeah, we don't yes. get every parameters in the GNN to be important. There may be some parameters not very important, then the L1 and L2 norms can minimize it to zero. Okay. Yes. Cool. Yes. So, yeah, then we can go to the total loss in the equation four. So here actually, yes. the cross entropy loss times the regression loss will automatically remove those subhalos that does not contain the relevant properties we want. And okay. then the Mm -hmm. Also, we need to minimize the cross entropy loss itself and also the L1 and L2 norms. And yeah. we assign some weights to these individual loss. So, and that's a hyperparameter for our model. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Yep. So, okay, now we have the loss for a machine to read. But for humans, us to understand what the model does, we need those metrics to gauge our model. Yes. So here we come to uh, five different mat metrics. So in the first one, here we have the F1 score, which can gauge the performance of the classification or the crop, or this is, this corresponds to the uh, cross entropy loss. So okay. the reason why we use F1 sco score is that it's a combination of precision and the recall, which is commonly used in machine learning. Mm -hmm. And these two uh, parameters are important. And so we want to simultaneously assess those two parameters, then we uh, combine that into the F1 score. Cool. Gotcha. And then for the regression part, we have the scatter and the bias. So the scatter is the standard deviation of the predicted population subtracted by the true uh, true value of different features. Yes. And then the bias is the mean of the, uh, yes. the mean of the error. Yes. yes. Okay. And then, okay. so okay. these two features are, mm, can be strongly affected by outliers. So we need some more metrics to gauge uh, our prediction. So the first one is the Pearson correlation coefficient. Okay. This can, uh, 
this assess the linear correlation between the true and the predicted prediction of the model. Mm -hmm. And okay. then we got the coefficient of determination. Then. So this uh, presents the proportion of the predicted population that can be explained by the true population. Right. Okay. Okay. So yep. for the scatter and the and the bias, the lower it goes, the better the the model predicts. Mm -hmm. And for the F one score, the uh, row and the R square value, uh -huh. uh, the value should be closer to one for a perfect uh, prediction. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh huh. I'm with you. Very cool. Okay. So now we can go to the result and see how our model uh, comparing to other models. So here we compare our models with some commonly used models, such as the abundance matching and the multiple layer perceptron. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah. and both of them uh, only takes in the dark matter properties at redshift zero, while our graph neural network can take uh, the information from merger trees. So let's compare these different models and see whether merger information is important in our prediction. Gotcha. Cool. And here we also <laughs> need to want to have a baseline to know what's the best possible prediction we can have. So we also have a a uh, chaotic uncertainty limit, which will be discussed in the later section. Yes. So this, so here we can go to the table one. Okay, okay, good, I'm with you. Okay, table one. Okay. So in table one, we can see in the left-hand side, we have the predict, uh, the features we want to predict, the stellar mass, star formation rate, color, gas mm -hmm. mass, gas metallicity, and stellar metallicity. Mm -hmm. And the upper part of the this table is comparing the uh, performance of different models at redshift zero. Mm -hmm. Then the bottom part of this table is the overall comparison from redshift one to, uh, sorry, redshift zero to redshift two. Yes, okay. okay. So then in the second column, we see the chaotic chaotic limit of the scatter. So this is, if we have a perfect machine, which can do a perfect prediction, the yes. limitation of that machine sh should have a, for example, a scatter of 0 0.1 for the stellar mass and 0 0.35 for star formation rate, etc. Yeah. Yes. yes. And then in the third column, we show the method that we are comparing to. We are comparing ma majorly to the multiple layer perception, but for stellar mass, we also use abundance matching. Yeah. Yeah. Weird, yeah. And then in the fourth column, we can see the scatter of uh, these different methods. Uh -huh. So here we can see the graph neural network can overperform all the other methods in all the different properties. Yeah. Yes. So that. Okay. And also we can see that the improvement from ML multiple layer perception to graph neural network is larger in stellar mass and gas mass and the stellar metallicity, while the others, the improvement in other properties are lower. Yeah. So I'll explain why this is the case yeah. in the later part. Yeah, okay. systematically lower, okay. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. then we have the improvement, which basically means the improvement from multiple layer perceptron to graph neural network uh -huh. of the scatter. And okay. then we have the other uh, metrics like the correlation coefficient and the R squared. Yes. So, and F1, mm -hmm. F1 score. So for the uh, correlation coefficient and R squared, the GNN also overperform the multiple layer perceptron. Yeah. Well, the for yes. the classification, uh -huh. the uh -huh. our model is also can also Good. outperform the yeah. multiple layer perceptron. Yeah, yes. yeah, and this is also the case in 
the redshift up to z equals two. So uh... that means our model is fully leveraging the merger tree nice. information. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. Um with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now if we want to okay. we would like to go into uh look at the more detailed prediction in different properties. So nice. we can look at figure three. Uh, yep, yep, very good. Okay, so in this figure, what we are looking at is basically in x-axis. It's the true values of different properties listed in each panel. Yes. And for the y-axis, we look at the predicted values. And we'll start with stellar mass. So for the stellar mass, we can see that okay. the... <clears throat> oh, so I also need to explain that the contours inside is the density field of data points yes and one the solid contours are the for the GNN and the dotted lines are for the multiple layer perceptron mm -hmm. and a perfect predictor should have a a prediction closer to the diagonal dotted line yes so now we can see that GNN outperforms multiple layer perceptron in stellar mass and then we can also look at the color cool. okay. in the right-hand panel. And wow. we can see that our graph neural network can predict the red you... galaxies to the red, uh, to the right, sorry, and for the yeah. blue galaxies to the left. Uh -huh. But it's get a hard time to predict the galaxies within the green valley. Well, the significant improvement from our model uh, from the multiple layer perceptron to GNN is that the, the as you can see the data is a bit biased in Green Valley for the multiple layer perceptron and our model can uh, fix that cool. bias yes, cool. by a bit. Okay, mm -hmm. then we can also go to the uh, the stellar metallicity mm -hmm. in the right panel. Yes. And mm -hmm. oh, maybe you can like zoom it out a bit. Okay. There you go. So for stellar metallicity and gas mass and the star formation rate, we can see that for lower values of those, uh, the uh, scatter of the prediction uh, becomes larger. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Goes right. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and here it's also worth mentioning that for the gas metallicity and the gas mass, we can see there are a, yeah. a cut in the upper and the lower value of the plot. Well, this comes with, <clears throat> this is because that the Prediction may be flawed if we don't have uh, the enough information at that time, uh, at that position. Yes. Yes. So it tends to predict the value closer to the uh, limitation. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. 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 So then we can go to the discussion mm -hmm. and yeah we can here we also compare our model with the okay. uh, chaotic limit and also there are several and this is also connected to the uh, reason why some of our predicted properties uh, improves more from the multiple layer perceptron and some other properties doesn't. Yes. So for those without significant improvement from multiple layer perceptron, you can see that they are very stochastic uh, features. And yeah. in the figure five, 
Yep. Uh, yep, yep, yep. I show some examples in mm -hmm. the left hand side for star formation rate, the middle column for the gas metallicity, and the right column for the color. And the. Uh, Will it fill, it, fill it down? Uh, I lost it. Are we on figure oh, five? Sorry. Here so go. figure, figure five. five. Figure five. Yes. Sorry. All good. All good. Now okay. it makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes. So the true value is denoted by the, oh, so I should explain this first. So the x-axis is the age of the universe and the y-axis is the value of different properties. Yes. And the true values are denoted by the red lines. And these, as you can see, are very stochastic. And we also have the predicted values in the blue lines, yes. which can overall recover the Cool. Stochastic uh, over okay. which can recover the overall feature of those uh, properties, but it cannot recover the stochastic part yes. of those properties. Like in there, yeah. So yes. therefore, we also try to smooth the uh, true value, okay. and that's denoted in the black line. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, and then we can go to table two. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, I'm with you. So when you smoothed out, was that like just a boxcar filter? Uh, yes. Okay. So okay. I smoothed it with a window of 10 snapshots. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it looks, okay, good. I'm with you. Okay, yes. 55. So two. if we can go to table yes. two. Harrison, GNN, and true. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So now we can see that after smoothing the feature the evolution of each feature and we uh subtract that smooth feature with our prediction then we calculate the scatter and now we can see that right. the scatter for the original which is the which is in the third column in this table yes uh, this oh sorry the second column shows the <clears throat> Uh, scatter for the prediction of all the merger, the mm -hmm. four merger trees. Then in the third column, we show the scatter of the prediction only in the main primary branch of the merger tree. Okay. And then we smooth the features in the main primary branch and then subtract it with our prediction. Then we have the fourth column, the sigma smoothed. Cool. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for the as you can see, for star formation rate, the color, and also the gas metallicity, the difference between the ah. main scatter and the smooth scatter is larger than the other properties. And yeah. that's explaining why our model doesn't have much uh, improvement in those different properties. Uh -huh. Yes. And so one of the things we really wanted to kind of ask ourselves is why is it that our simulation is so impacted by this chaos? Because of course, when we are when we are running a, an algorithm algorithm to find a general relationship, one of the things you can't capture is chaos. Mm -hmm. um, and so this stochasticity where everything is going up and down, up and down, up and down uh, all the time um, sets sets this effective chaotic limit of our model. So that's yeah. the best possible performance. And one of our, our amazing co-authors, uh, uh, Shai Canel, um, had uh, earlier tried to quantify, you know, kind of, uh, he wrote another paper in AppJ uh, about this uh, chaotic effect in simulations, but essentially what he did was try to take the same setup as in as in TNG 300, the, the simulations that we're using, and uh, and simply take a simulation, run it forward to Redshift 5, um, stop it there, and then kind of uh, split up uh, every identified galaxy into two uh, two different parts where um, two different shadow simulations and then run it forward again. And then uh, um, where in one of the shadow simulations, he had um, he had uh, made infinitesimal uh, changes. So, you know, last digit kind of rounding error changes in the floats of yeah. the positions of the particles in, 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 in one of the one of the one of the galaxies and then run everything forward again. Everything else the same, all the same parameters, all the same random seed, everything. Um, but as as this figure here in in, in Chai's paper from from twenty nineteen shows, wow. um, you get very different things out in the end. And then you, um, 
-hmm. And this is not something, of course, we can debate whether or not this this actually happens in 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 the real universe, but uh, but but a priori, it it at least sets a, a limit to uh, how well you can predict um uh, the properties of a galaxy because if you yes. if you give me the galaxy at, at richard five and say you know like like you know what is this what is this galaxy going to do it's a little bit uh -huh. uh, unclear exactly what is this galaxy going to end up in because you know of course there was here there was a a true uh um underlying uh galaxy um w without the perturbations but these rounding errors happen in computers all the time uh -huh. like this is something that just happens um uh, you also get the same effect if you take uh, the simulation and you run it on an even versus an odd number of CPUs, um, because uh, an even versus an odd number of CPUs handles rounding errors differently, and so you get the same effect. And mm -hmm. so, because we get these minuscule effect, if we go if we go back to our paper, yeah. you get uh, you, you you get different uh, you get different results in the end. But we are using these as the fundamental truths we are trying to hit. But right. because there's noise in noise in that fundamental truth, there is also a, a, you know a limit to what we uh, what we can what we can achieve, and that is that that's part of what we're what we're trying to quantify here is saying, well, if we try to to dampen that noise a little bit, do we do yes. you know do we do better? And the and the features we see that you know get improved a lot are the things that are uh, impacted mostly by by um, by processes happening on shorter timescales. Yeah. So for, for example, like star formation rate and color, which are determined on, you know, you know, uh, maybe hundreds of mega years uh, timescales. So in a, so over the course of a couple of snapshots, where if you get if you get a stochastic thing happening uh, in one of those in, in just one snapshot, then the entire galaxy changes, like the color becomes, you know, oh, yeah. like, Oh, yeah. if, if you if you get a burst of star formation at some uh, you know at some snapshot or if you don't which is it which is stochastic in the simulation then the star formation rate you know changes wildly and that is just very um and that's that that's why it's very hard to predict okay. um and i think this also uh, uh ties in nicely to one of the uh one of the other nice things about having uh, an algorithm such as this one here with a uh, with a with a gaussian loss is that you can get uncertainties on your predictions you can get an estimated scatter for for this galaxy here what do we what like how much wiggle room actually is in the properties of this thing here yeah. um which as somebody coming from you know more of the the data the statistics side is very 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 nice yeah uh, um not even just for for us uh for us to be able to look at you know our prediction and say like does it does it make sense but also for using this for downstream tasks if you want to if you want to say you know you want to fill a giant n body simulation with galaxies it's right. really nice to know what is the uncertainty associated to each object which is not something that comes with either abundance matching or any like normal simulation yeah. again what, what the the limit that we have here is is an ensemble uh, uh chaotic limit because in order to get this you know shy has average over a bunch of galaxies um but we kind of get it for free that we you know because it, it's 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 in the loss function so we get a we get a sigma and we have a we have a figure uh can just kind of validate validating that that this you know went well uh in the in the appendix figure six and seven where we can show that that actually that that the residuals we get if we take our residuals and divide them by the predicted uncertainties if you go down to figures uh, figure seven so one one more yes yes just absorbing that. um okay. we get these very nice you know Gaussian error distributions this is just you know z c scores just defined as the residual divided by the by the um by the uh, by the by the predicted uncertainty and so you can see that that these these look relatively Gaussian um that you know uh for an astronomer this is not too far off yeah uh, so um so um we were happy with that and even if you just if you scroll up again to figure six yeah uh, we can just see that that you know when we when we are predicting so on the y-axis here you see the predicted uncertainty and on the uh, and on the x-axis we see the actual error that we got cool. and we can see very nicely of course that you know as we go further up in general uh um, along our you know predicted uncertainties or we're predicting high uncertainties yeah. well we also have larger errors um it's nice <laughs> how that works sometimes yeah. um but but, yeah. but but looking at at the at the simulations from from this view of not just providing uh truth but a very noisy truth um you know that's strongly affected by chaotic uh effects it really provided a, a, a kind of a, a nice uh, comparison uh, for saying, are we doing a good job or not? Like, you know, like, because it um, different simulations are very uh, differently affected by this. Um, a hydrodynamical simulation sure. is very affected sure. by this because everything is moving. 
if you were to, for example, take a semi-analytic model where the um, where the merger tree is is already uh, already made and there's nothing you can do to change the merger tree, but you're just uh, you're just say changing the random seed of the of the semi-analytic model and then you're running that. That has uh, that has less impact from uh, uh, from chaotic effects just because one of the components of the model is fixed and so you can't change that. Right. Whereas uh, here in a, in a hydrodynamic model, you know everything is moving, um, and so. Um, yeah, and and I think that was um, I think that was that was that was a cool comparison to make. Even though you know, uh, again, yeah, yeah uh, shout out to 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 uh, to Shai for for being willing to to rerun a lot of these experiments uh, um, so that we could uh, we could get to uh, we could get to use the use them in our paper. Um, yeah, it was uh, yeah, very nice. Have, have him on have him on as well, and it was yeah, it was good to see that everything worked out in the end. Also, yes. Uh, of course, when you're using a Gaussian last, you're kind of making that you're you're kind of forcing the errors to be Gaussian. Um, so in in a way, it shouldn't be all too surprising that the errors turn out to be Gaussian. But yeah. if I can't get them to do that, if they're if they're really really not Gaussian, then they're just gonna be weird. Um, um. So um. So um. It was uh. Yeah. It was great that everything everything ended up uh working out well and um, yeah. Uh -huh. And everything and, and, and everything ended up making sense. The things that you know don't get a lot of experience uh or don't get a lot of. Uh, improvement from having the experience of the merger tree added in, other things happening on short time scales that are very affected by stochastic effects. Mm -hmm. Kind of, you know, the, the the things that that shouldn't remember don't remember, and the things that like do remember something like still a mass, which is something that builds up over, you know, that's that's the you know, builds up over a long time. So it's not as affected by you know a, a, an individual snapshot oh, nice. mm -hmm. uh, stochasticity, um, and so that is that that's something where we're very good. Very nice. And in general, this works very well when you have something that you know, kind of builds up slowly over time. Works less well when when it's something that that doesn't build up uh, over time. Um, very nice. Cool. Very cool. Very cool. All right. That was awesome. Can you, Chris? So, oh, go ahead. Mm, I mean. So in the <clears throat> yeah, I think yeah, that's overall of our paper. Yeah, yeah. very yes. cool, very very nice. Got a list of four punchlines there, and Chin Yu and Christian. I want to thank you so much for walking us through your very beautiful mm -hmm. APJ article. Thank you so much. And uh, let's see, you kind of touched on it a little bit uh, at various points. And so so let me just push on it a little bit. Um, uh, where do you think we go from here, given, given the published article? Are there additional data sets to try out? Uh, is there other properties to go after? Do we put this up against the telescope, um, et cetera? And so um, uh, where do you think we go from here, given the published article? So. There are a couple of things already in the works um, because uh, this has this has been been done already for a couple of different simulation types, um, and so we we know that it works really well. Um, but um, there are a couple of people that are already working at applying this to satellite galaxies. We mainly nice. wanted to refer ourselves to central galaxies just for a variety of reasons. The people are trying to apply this to saying to say uh, um, satellite statistics, um, even just for doing stuff even with our own Milky Way. So very different from what we are doing, where we're doing this across a giant cosmological simulation where they're trying to say, if I have a merger tree um, and I want to look at the, the Milky Way satellite plane, yes. um, if I take a merger and I add it in or, or take it away, you know, like how does that change my predictions for the number of satellites yes. uh, and how they're distributed in space? Um, and so this is one of the things that people have been focusing a lot with with the, with the Gaia source of Enceladus merger recently is, you know, like how are we as a galaxy impacted by the things that happened, you know, right. in the past, back to what we've been doing. And one of the you know new things that people have started to look at in order to break some of the degeneracies there are in in that analysis is how does it affect our satellites? Uh, and so um, that's one of one one of the things that's hap uh, that's happening now. Um, and then I think there's also uh, there's also ongoing work in saying for uh, for Chinyu's uh, work here to say well where exactly is the information coming from? Uh, is it coming from from the earliest times? Is it coming from the latest times? You know like when do we really Right. Uh, get information from, and so there are so there are there are people working on that uh, already. And that's great. Cool. And also, my personal well interest is to 
maybe apply the same model to the constraint simulations. So the constraint mm -hmm. simulations are the mm. fixed dark matter only simulation that can mm. recreate, uh, reproduce the true dis the actual distribution in the observation. And yeah. then if we can get the observed properties from the galaxies and the merger and merger trees from the dark matter only simulations, then we can maybe try to learn what's the uh what's the relation between the true galaxies and our assumed uh, cold dark matter models. Yes. Yeah. Cool. There's nice. also going the other way. Now we shouldn't we shouldn't forget that. Say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like if you give me a galaxy, what is the most likely uh, merger tree that belongs to that galaxy? Ooh, that's a good all, question. All of these things, uh, there that's are all these question. things, as Tenyu as was kind of pointing out with the constraint, constraint simulation stuff, it's all happening happening in simulation space. So um, ideally, we want to be able to also go out and say, okay, well, well, we have a galaxy here. You know, what what is the most likely merger tree that that's made that galaxy in real life? And so... Um, the fact that we can prove that there is, you know, that we do see a, a solid impact on the on the on the galaxy in the end gives us some confidence that we can turn it around and go the other way, because we know that there is a relation that goes from A to B, and so there is a, a, a we can at least postulate that it probably also isn't is a, is a relation we can exploit to go from B to A, uh, and so that is that is something that is some some work that will will, will get started in in June, uh, um, cool. and so uh, excited to, uh, to 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 do that now. Very nice. Very cool. Well, it's going to be really exciting to see this develop over the next couple of years as the stuff all comes together. So it'll be very cool to see. Thank you so much. Can you, Franklin, thank you once again, for walking us through your very lovely article. Yeah, thank you very much. And that will do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.